Okay. What's up? So, this is an uh, impromptu live stream on a Monday. It's actually a holiday in Canada. I don't know why uh, you Americans don't have this day off. But, this is a story that I was actually working on last week. I was going to do a video on it this weekend. I've been kind of sick, so did not really have the time to do this video. But I still want to cover this. And as I was developing this story, or this video... I kept coming across more and more <laughs> that I wanted to add to it and cover, including a video from uh, David Jolly's appearance here on MSNBC that I'll go over in this video. So it just got to the point where it's like, I want to cover this still, but it's going to be too long to do like a segment on it. So I'll do it uh, through this live stream. And the benefit of that is I can talk to you while doing it and get some feedback here because look, I'm going to be as open and fair as possible because of course my initial impression and still largely <laughs> i'm very skeptical here but my initial impression was that this was just completely as dumb as the initial idea with the forward party and there was no real policy here and there still isn't any real policy here but they sort of explain this a little better now than they had in the past and I think it's worth at least exploring what they are trying to do here by being as fair as possible while also discussing the obvious um, pitfalls, uh, you know, in the midst of all of that. So, the forward party. That is what we are here to discuss. So, of course, last week, so this, I mean, this occurred earlier than last week when Andrew Yang first came out, uh, I guess it was last year, to announce his forward party. Well, this is now a new iteration of it. So the Ford Party has now combined forces with two other um, organizations, and I'll tell you those in a second here. But headline from Reuters: Former Republicans and Democrats from New Th or sorry, form New Third uh, U.S. Political Party. So they go on to say here: the merger involves the Renew America movement, formed in 2021 by dozens of former officials in the Republican administrations of Reagan, H.W. Uh, Bush, W. Bush, and Trump. The Forward Party, founded by Yang, and the Serve America Movement, a group of Democrats and Republicans and Independents whose executive director is former Republican Congressman David Jolly. And as I said, we'll get to his discussion with Simone Sanders here in a bit. But so the Forward Party, this is what their aim is. Their aim is to gain party registration and ballot access in 30 states by the end of 2023 and in all 50 states by late 2024. Important to note here, this is not simply about running a third choice in 24. It's not clear if they're still even going to do that or if that is, uh, you know, one of their goals here. But they do sort of have this bottom up approach that a lot of typical third parties have not taken. And that is at least one aspect of this that I do find a little more interesting about this attempt at a third party compared to previous third parties. So this is not simply about trying to, you know, swing an election uh, to one president over the other, but it's more about actually trying to build a party. Now, how they go about doing that, we're going to have to see. <laughs> but uh, just from that base level, it is a little better of a strategy here than we've seen typically from these uh these third party runs but so it aims to field candidates for local races such as school boards and city councils in state houses and the u.s congress and all the way up to the presidency which by the way this is sort of what the democratic party should be trying to do a little more of especially in you know states they typically ignore this is really more of a lesson if anything for democrats in terms of where they should be putting a lot of their effort that they, you know, are not, um, and more specifically progressives, if you want to, you know, build power, you kind of have to start from the ground up to be able to achieve that kind of power. But that's what this party is planning to do. Now, there are like, there are, <laughs> I, I ping pong back and forth, because some of the, the statements they put out are just so ridiculous, and just mean nothing. This is an example of that. The Ford Party is a political home for everyone willing to set aside the partisan extremes and find practical ways to make this country better. 
in what world, and, and they become more clear about this, about what they're talking about here, that this is about both parties. In what world is the Democratic Party an extreme? What world are you living in to try and claim that? And I will go through their, their, their Washington Post op-ed where they try to claim it and debunk how stupid it is. But this is, if you at least be honest about what the party is. If you want to build a party from the ground up where each state may have different policy positions, and that is what, as you'll see, what they claim to, to, to want to do, then be honest about that, about what that, that being your party. That's what the party's about. Don't try and make this assessment of the current political landscape that just is not true. You can't claim there are these two extreme parties and we're in the middle somewhere. And then in other interviews, like the one I'm going to show you, they claim, no, it's not about the, just the moderates. You can't have it both ways. You have to have a clear message here about what the party actually is. But they are all over the place in terms of what this party is. Another example of that, Andrew Yang here saying, I've been to the DNC National Convention and let me say, I think the forward party can throw a better party. Now, you may just see this as like some random remark. It doesn't mean anything. But I see this and think, if you want to throw a better party, where's that money coming from? Who is sponsoring the party? Who are you hanging around with that now has influence on what the party is? So look, I know he's not trying to say anything here, but that's that's what he is signaling with some, with a comment like this. They have to understand what this party is, where the money is going to be coming from, the obvious influence that will have, not just, to, I mean, you, you can claim, oh yeah, we'll take this money, but it's not going to bother us, or it's not going to influence us. You can try and claim that, but then that's the company you keep. That's the perspectives you take on. So you look, a lot of this from all sides, is just pure speculation of what this is actually going to become, if it becomes anything at all. And I guess that's the biggest if. But, you know, you're not sending out good signals when you are sending out uh, mixed messages. And then, you know, stuff like this. Two questions, how do you think things are going? And you really think it's going to be just Democrats and Republicans in, say, 2040? And he, you know, looks at this. This is a Gallup poll, which, of course, I've, I've referenced this many times how most people identify as independent, that doesn't mean they all have the same perspective. Now, to their credit, this party, as I'll show you, is claiming they're not going to be taking on the exact same perspective within the same party, which is an interesting approach depending on the issue <laughs> because they even extend that to abortion rights. Yet in their same they have like a list of like three things they care about. One of them is is um, is individual freedom. So how are you both okay with stripping rights away from women, but individual freedom is one of your three you know tenets? How can you claim both? So there really has to be some clarity here in terms of what they want this party to be, what they are messaging, and the obvious conflicts already in that messaging. That is, again, that isn't to say that this is all trash. They have some good um, analysis of the electoral process, issues. You know, they want to see ranked choice voting. They want to see open primaries. I completely agree with that. But when you bring in some of, you know, some of your strategies here and how they obviously conflict with what your uh, three main goals are, you have to question what is the point of all of this. Now, also worth mentioning... This was from Andrew Yang's run for mayor in New York City. GOP mega donors fund Andrew Yang super PAC. So the influence of super PACs, which, you know, they don't have control over, at least they're not supposed to have any control over. You can't, in the current system, you can't control what these PACs will do. So if you intend to have, you know, different representatives for each or, or different perspectives represented in each state, depending on what, what the electorate wants. Well, how do you know that these PACs won't simply just, you know, put all their money into a certain perspective and then essentially buy that perspective for that state? This is another issue that they haven't really been able to, you know, deal with or communicate in terms of how they're going to deal with 
the influence of money on politics. But you see how, you know, they came to Yang and Yang, I guess, didn't seem to care, didn't say anything, didn't reject any of that support. All right, let's go over this interview. So I found this interview to be interesting because it both raises points that I agree with. And I think David Jolly here, as much as I hate to say it, because I don't really care for David Jolly's perspective on politics, but he makes some good points. And then that also as well conflict with what the party has already said. But then he also says some really dumb shit. So let's play this and uh, I will pause as we go through it. Politics are extremely polarized, but what to do about it? Mm, that's where we can disagree. This week, former Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang said his solution is a new political party. Yang and two of his co-founders wrote an op-ed in The Washington Post this week, launching the Forward Party, claiming his bid to start a third party would succeed where others failed. My friend David Jolly is one of those co-founders of the Forward Party. He's a former congressman from Florida, an MSNBC contributor, and he's with us right now. Greetings, David. Okay. It's good to be with you, Simone. I know you disagree with me, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't even have to say it. We Look, David, for folks that don't know, I have known David Jolly for a while, okay? I've known him through all the many iterations of my little career. And, David, I'm skeptical. So I'm, I'm just going to let you start. Tell the people at home why you think this is going to work. So look, we know by the numbers the demand signal is there. 40% of Americans currently reject either major party. Over 60% have suggested we need a new party. I think what is often uh, mistaken, though, in past efforts is that they think that that 40% are all moderates, and that's not the case. Uh, the forward party, and understand I'm not assuming an official role with the party. I, I helped lead talks into a merger. But the forward party, for the very first time, Simone, is the coming together of left, right, and middle. Imagine that a party that embraces and celebrates diversity of thought, independent thought, around just some basic tenets of economic opportunity, personal liberty, defense of democracy. And we actually think we could come together around these shared values. And that 40% of America that today has said, I can't see myself in the Republican or Democratic Party, just might see themselves in the new forward party. All right, so I got to pause here. This was one thing that made me think, okay, at least he gets it. Because this is what has not been discussed bef before by Andrew Yang or anybody else that wants to, you know, do this third party stuff. The idea that that 40% all think the same. They clearly don't. They're not. And by the way, what is a moderate? Like the Democratic Party are to the right of where the country is. So you look at public polling on the vast majority of issues on health care, on taxes, on climate on wages, go down the list, on the influence of corporations, the influence of money in politics, the vast majority of people lean left on almost every issue. So looking at that, both parties are to the right of the center. The center being what the majority of people in the country think. So a moderate technically <laughs> would be a progressive the way that politics actually is viewed or these policies are viewed by the public. But anyways, in, in Washington speak, you know, moderate is like Joe Manchin, who is far right of where the country actually is. But Jolly's correct to point out that, you know, these people are all over the place. They, they just don't like both parties because both parties don't serve them. And largely, as you see from polling, it's mostly because they serve corporations and not actual people. So... The point being here, though, he gets that there's a need here to to attract a wide variety of people, if that's their intention, is to gain the support of that 40%. So he understands at least that part of it. But there's more. We'll, we'll get into it. Okay, so I want to talk about the values in a second, because I have thoughts about the values yeah. piece. But first, I want to talk about this reality. I don't disagree that um, there are lots of people out there who would want a third party. But the reality is, at the very least, you don't have a party unless you can fundraise. You can't fundraise unless you have paperwork. So where is the paperwork, David? Is there paperwork? 
Yeah, look, these are three organizations that, that merged that have been building parties already. There's already legal recognition in about four states of political committees that will be recognized in about 15 states by the end of this year, 35 next year, and all 50, <clears throat> excuse me, in 24. And the important thing about that, Simone, here's the other mistake that's made. And you're going to see groups try to do this in 24. People think you declare a national party and you run somebody for president. That's garbage. Yes, yes. The way that you is not build what you do. a viable okay, we agree there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's garbage. The way you, you couldn't actually do that. You couldn't file a party today and get ballot access in 50 states in 2024. And then you have you run the risk of you know, are you tilting the lever the right way or the wrong way? What I will tell you is to build a credible, durable, sustainable national party, you're actually building 50 states parties and aggregating them. And that's where the politics of Texas are different than Massachusetts, Florida different than California. And the reality is no party today starts out an election cycle saying, we're going to compete in all 50 states. Forward is saying, let's elect mayors, township supervisors, state legislators in all 50 states and become the, the third largest party in the United States. So based on this definition of what the party is supposed to be, this is more, this is more or less sort of a uh, unifying of independent voices that only have the, their only u unifying message is on what is th those three tenets are so um we get to them later uh but it's, one is like freedom here i'll just skip to it so we're at 324 I'll, I'll get back to this but they list them somewhere and of course twitter is the worst with this but one is like uh, freedom, basically, like individual freedoms. Um, another is on the electoral system and having to reform that. America's power. Here we go. So free people revitalize a culture that celebrates difference and individual choice, rejects hate, and removes barriers so that each of us can rise to our full potential. Which, as I said earlier directly conflicts with the idea that you're going to welcome in people that are for, for, for a forced birth. But thriving communities re reinvigorate a fair, flourishing economy and open society where everyone can live a good life and is safe in the places where we learn, work, and live. That is very vague. Not really sure what that even means. Vibrant democracy. Reform our republic to give Americans more choices in elections, more confidence in a government that works, and more say in our future. So this is more about the reforming the electoral process, making voting easier and all that. So it's really about unifying independent voices because each state can have a different different position um depending on you know the electorate there on most issues except for i guess when it comes to things like ranked choice voting things like open primaries and um and as well as supposedly free people but you know we'll get to more on that when, when david jolly brings up the issue of abortion but back to where we were uh here united states so are you all electing mayors? And you said you're, it's recognized, not you, but the, the entity yeah. of which you have helped merge. So where are, where are the four right. states? Give me the four. The, the, the mayor of Newtown, Connecticut, was a okay. longtime Democratic mayor who switched his party affiliation to the Serve America movement, to the SAM party, and now serves as an, as an incumbent mayor. In the state of Texas, the Secretary of State recognizes that same party as a political organization. Pennsylvania, similarly. In New York, we ran a unity ticket for governor and lieutenant governor and got enough votes that we received party status and then Governor Cuomo kneecapped us and three other minor parties and said, no, I don't want competition. The demand is there, Simone, and I think the important thing is, is this. There's this immediate reaction by the body politic as though it's a threat. And I would suggest, how could you argue that if 40% of the country says, I can't see myself in a major party, that we shouldn't give that 40% another option? Or at least if one of the two major parties said, hey, why don't we go after the, that 40% that are, that are telling us they're unrepresented in our own party? If the major parties won't do it, I believe the forward party will. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. My only point here would be to say that um, uh, as long as the third option is viable, because in 2020, I will say the That's people right. that voted third party, they cast a ballot for Donald Trump. They did not cast a ballot, a viable ballot for anybody else yeah. other than President Trump. Okay, I want to talk about these values piece. Okay, so um, you say that the three priorities that define the forward party are free people, thriving communities, and a vibrant democracy. Right. These are great ideas, um, but they're 
kind of vague. So are there specific policy solutions coming? Well, no, because this is a different kind of party. There is no top-down dogma, no top-down platform. It is Simone, the politics in Birmingham, Alabama, are very different than Boston, Massachusetts. And I would suggest that the two major parties decide to ignore full regions of the country that don't fit into the top-down dogma. So when we talk about those three principles, it is what holds us together, frankly, as Americans, forget about a party, but then let's be big enough to embrace different thoughts on achieving economic opportunity and personal liberty, defense of democracy. A lot of people say, a new party, where do you stand on abortion? You know what? I think a political party today should be big enough to embrace voices from the pro-choice movement and the pro-life movement. This is a complex mm. issue for the entire year. This is where we get into, oh, this is all bullshit, okay. <laughs> because how can you say you're for free people, yet you are willing to embrace candidates that are a part of your party who are for forced birth? How can you embrace forced birth, yet claim to be for free people? So, no, you have to have a set of standards in terms of what your party is about on specific issues like that. You can't just be very vague about, oh, we're for freedom. Yeah, but then it, if you say you're for people that it's okay for someone who's for forced birth to be in a part of the party, then you're not actually for freedom. And he, he makes, he goes even further here. Let me just finish his point. Where do you stand on abortion? You know what? I think a political party today should be big enough to embrace voices from the pro-choice movement and the pro-life movement. This is a complex mm. issue for the entire United States. And I think mm. a big tent party is what a lot of people are looking for. Look, Simone, I, I, I hear your reaction. Here's what I will also tell you. If, if strict ideology, if strict dogma is what informs someone's politics, and that's okay, right? If your core convictions are around ideology, then the forward party is probably not for you. This is not about strict dogma or ideology. This is about human rights. Abortion rights are about human rights. So again, to couch that discussion in the idea of, oh, dogma, or you're being ideological, is just to completely have no connection to the issue, not care, not, I mean, ultimately you don't care. Otherwise you would have realized the obvious contradiction there. But it's, for him to use that as the example, he could have used any, like almost any other issue as an example. But he had to use that as the example, which goes to expose how useless this entire party is if that's what they're willing to accept into the party. You can't claim to be against extremism, yet accept people who are going to legislate against other others on abortion rights. It's ridiculous. And let me quickly go over it. So, because, look, I'm not sure if he's even part of the party. Like, he helped to negotiate the merger because he was he was leading one of the, the three groups that merged to form um, this version of the forward party. But because a lot of the stuff or some of the stuff he says here kind of contradicts what the article, the op-ed that he's actually a part of <laughs> um, says. So I highlighted some uh, points here. Let's quickly go over these. So I, just worth mentioning that a lot of Republicans are involved in the creation of this party, a lot more than Democrats. Yang was a Democrat just for the purposes of running for president. You know, he's not, he has no real, uh, there's no long, long history of Andrew Yang being, you know, a strong voice in the Democratic Party or anything. These others are, you know, former uh, congressman, former governor, Yang a candidate for president because he wanted to get his name out there. You know, not really uh, something worth comparing here. It's mostly run by Republicans as far as I can see so far. But, you know, maybe they'll hire some, some Bernie Sanders uh, people, <laughs> but I tend to doubt it. So they say here, two-thirds... Uh, so some of this I kind of went over already, but I'll just quickly. Two-thirds of voters think neither, yeah, both parties aren't right. It doesn't mean that, you know, one party is the solution because people in that that are for a third party all have different perspectives on what the policy should be. But uh, so this is where uh, there's a lot of false equivalencies here in terms of what the Democratic Party is versus what the Republican Party is. 
So they say, shockingly, 30 million Americans believe violence against the current government is justified. The same number want to forcibly return former President Donald Trump to the White House. This is what happens when democracies fail. So this line alone, I mean, this paragraph could be in an article about how extreme the right wing is. Because that's all this is about. You can't claim that the Democratic Party wants to force their former president back in. You can't claim, like, this 30 million are the conservatives that want to get Trump back in the White House, at least at the point of that poll. So they're pointing out, hey, look how extreme Republicans are. This is why you need a third party. But like, what's the extreme extremism on the left? They, they, they don't have any examples. So how do you like they create this scenario where it's like they're, and they're all also kind of purposely vague here about 30 million Americans. No, 30 million conservatives believe in violence against the current government. That's that's what this is. So like, again, this is more about a Democratic talking point than a point about why you need a third party. But to go on to say, the U.S. badly needs a new political party, one that reflects moderate common sense majority. Which, again, if we're looking at a modern common sense majority, look at polling on single payer health care. Look at poll, or even just a public option. Again, both parties are to the right of where public uh, policy actually is. So on, you know, cannabis legalization, massive support for that. Uh, single-payer health care, a public option, massive support for that. Uh, higher taxes on the wealthy, massive support for that. Real investments into, clim into the climate crisis, massive support for that. Go down the list, massive support for these progressive policies that neither party represents. The Democratic Party is to the right of where people actually are. So the forward party, you know, doesn't acknowledge that for obvious reasons. They're trying to appeal to all sides here and also not taking on any actual policy perspectives very conveniently as a way to try and bring the most amount of people in. But again, they say it's not really about the policies. It's not, it's not a top-down approach because each state may be different, which in some cases may be okay. But if you claim to be about freedom and then are accepting people who are, who are for forced birth into your party, then what is your party really about? So uh, roughly half Americans, we talked about this already, independence. This, this is stupid. The two major parties have hollowed out the sensible center of our political system, even though that's where most voters want to see them move. So David Jolly, in the interview I just showed you, said that most voters, most third parties make the mistake of thinking that most voters or those independent voters are all moderates, which they're not. They're left, center, right. Yet this article is saying, no, it's about the center. And David Jolly is one of the co-authors of this piece. So what is it? Is it about the center? Is it about all sides? What is your actual uh, perspective, your, your strategy here? I again, there is, no, there is no unified message. It's almost purposely, <coughs> excuse me. It's almost purposely all over the place as a way to try and get the most amount of people in. And now here's where we get to the only specifics they will actually offer. So on guns, and this is where like anyone that knows anything about the current climate in American politics can see right through all this garbage. On guns, most Americans don't agree with calls from the far left to confiscate all guns. And repeal the Second Amendment. Who, <laughs> who, who with any power? First of all, people on the left, actually, they want guns because they see the extreme right rising up. So I'm seeing a lot more calls from the left to uh, definitely not repeal the Second Amendment. So I, I don't like, this is, again, this is out of thin air. I'm not sure who's making this argument. Democrats definitely aren't, but this is the most important piece. So they say, this is what, you know, the left is saying. Then they say, but they're also rightfully worried by the far right's insistence on eliminating gun laws. So this is the Republican position. Do nothing about guns. That's the Republican position. 
This is not anywhere near the Democratic Party position. And you see this again and again. They equate the far left with the Democrats. Sorry, my voice is just terrible. I got to cough again. Jesus. All right. They claim that the far left, the far right, you know, they're the same. Yet the far left has no actual institutional power. Even if this was the far left position that they're calling to repeal the Second Amendment, which is not, that's not the position of the far left. But even if it was, they have no power. They're not in the Democratic Party. These people are the Republican Party. On climate change, most Americans don't agree with calls from the far left to completely upend our economy and way of life. Like, what does that even mean? Is climate change not upending your life right now? Look at what's happening in Kentucky with those floods. This extreme weather is happening all the time as a result of the climate crisis. So in terms of upending your life, well, climate change is already doing that. And again, very vague about completely upend our economy and way of life. There's actually an attempt here to try and transition people away from fossil fuels while there is still time. That's what the actual left, that is what the actual scientists are saying. The left, the actual left, not the party, not the Democratic Party, because they're definitely not doing this, but the actual left is following the science. That is the rational thing to do. Yet the right, which is the Republican Party, reject the, or, the, or, reject or denial. Wait, what is it saying? Reject the far right's denial. Or they're saying they also reject the far right's denial that there is even a problem. So this is, I mean, to be fair, at this point, they, as far as I've seen, most of the GOP is at least acknowledging that, yeah, something's happening, <laughs> the climate's changing, but but we can't do anything about it. It's not it's not the fault of humans, so we can't change it. Why try to change it? Uh, again. Essentially, it's the same position because the end goal is the exact same, which is do nothing. Let it happen. So that is the position of the Republican Party is just do nothing about it. Meanwhile, this is not the position of the Democratic Party. And on abortion, again, most Americans don't agree with the far left's extreme views on late term abortions. What what even is this? Like this is this is a purely fear-mongering Republican talking point that that the left wants to kill babies in the womb at you know they they're, they're going to be born tomorrow they, they want to kill them the <laughs> the day before like nobody nobody brings a child through or or brings a a fetus through 9 months wanting to deliver um a child only to decide randomly to then abort it that doesn't happen. It, in the cases where there are late-term abortions, they're always in the case of it has to do with the mother's health. It's not because they came in one day and was like, you know what? We got the room made up. We got the crib. We painted the walls. But I realized I don't want a baby now. <laughs> so get rid of this thing. That doesn't happen. But that's what this clownish view of what uh, conservatives try to gin up. That's what that is. And that's what this stupid article is trying to take on and it definitely is not the position of the democratic party which you just saw nancy pelosi and democratic leadership back henry cuellar an anti-choice democrat over jessica cisneros in texas showing you that that party the democratic party does accept both views on abortion one of the points that david jolly made and that they're making here that they want to actually that they're not even trying to make here, which is, again, so bizarre. David Jolly in the interview is like, yeah, we should accept, you know, all views on abortion. Yet in this piece, they're saying, actually, no. Uh, they are also alarmed by the far right's quest to make a woman's choice a criminal offense. But David Jolly in this piece was like, no, we want to accept people that are, that are um, uh, what they call pro-life, um, but in reality, anti-choice for, for forced birth. So... Again, there is no real unity in messaging here. They don't really know what they are. But again, point being, this is the position of the Republican Party. 
This is not the position of the Democratic Party. So this sensible center that they're talking about, like, where is it? In their minds, in the way that they're defining it, it would be where the Democratic Party currently is. But again, that would not be the center because that is to the right of where most people are. But that is what the center would be in the way that they are writing this article, which makes it even more bizarre that they are calling for a third party here when the Democratic Party appears to have the positions that, <laughs> that the forward party is advocating for. So they say we will passionately advocate, uh, and this is the only part where they make any sense, is they advocate for electoral changes as ranked choice voting and open primaries, the end of gerrymandering. And again, all of this requires power within the system to change. Power that I guess they are trying to build, but doing so in a very bizarre way. Um, uh, to be fair, though, start as I said, starting local, starting on, on a ground level actually is a good way to, to, to start it. But in terms of changing these big issues, you need power on a much higher level. Oh, my God. All right. So a few more pieces here. So this is where we get to they want an open party. So it doesn't matter, you know. What party you're a part of invited to be part of the process without abandoning their existing political affiliations? All right. An open, open party. And yeah, so then they go on to find, so we are actively recruiting former U.S. representatives, governors, entrepreneurs, top political operatives, and... Oh, by the way, also community leaders, sure. But like, they use this whole piece to discuss how the current system does not work. Yet they go on to ask or say they're actively recruiting people who have been working in the current system that doesn't work. So <laughs> why, why do you want to recruit people who were in the system that you are saying and correctly pointing out has not been effective yet you want those same people who have not been effective to be a part to be a part of your party like the only thing here that makes sense is yes you should be seeking community leaders and maybe people like i don't know teachers nurses doctors scientists i know for a lot of them it's like a downgrade to to be in in politics but if you want to have a different view on politics on lawmaking, then you would actively recruit people who are not normally in government, not people who have been serving in government their entire lives after claiming that you don't want those people. It's a very bizarre, all over the place approach here. But this is what it is. I don't know. <laughs> like, again, there are good aspects of it, like the idea of, uh, I'll get to that in a second. But the idea of like, you know, running local offices, school districts, good. That's, I think that's a, it, not good for them, but in, in terms of trying to grow power as a party, that's what parties should be doing. That's what the Democratic Party should be doing. But you're, you know, to have this very disjointed approach to what the party's actually about, who it actually serves, not really be clear about, are you serving what you call moderates? Are you looking at the actual center, which is progressive to where the actual parties are right now? There is, it's very, it's incredibly incoherent is, is the major problem here. So Will Conway, who is the uh, uh, national organizing director for the forward party, a former Republican operative, says here, criticizing forward party for not having policy solutions is like criticizing Spotify for not releasing their own music. Spotify is the tool to distribute music. We're the tool to facilitate dialogue and consensus. Listening to an Oasis CD on repeat? Want more options? Here it is. So, initially, this read completely incoherent. But their strategy here, as he goes on to point out, um, later on, after he, res he responded to me, uh, it's about investing more locally and actually having... I, I, yes, this is their, again, this is their idea here. Have 
different positions depending on where you are. So if what's successful, this again, this is their perspective. What's successful in, you know, Florida may not be successful in, in uh, you know, Massachusetts, then they're going to be different policies depending on where that forward candidate is running, which at that point, it's really just, as I said earlier, a bunch of independents connected by a few shared values, which is what I showed you earlier, freedom, and ultimately, uh, issues around voting, rank choice voting, you know, democracy, gerrymandering. So I guess that's an idea. But, uh, you know, to be so all over the place, I guess, is, is the biggest problem here. And so I replied to this saying, this is incoherent, and I guess that's the point, be as vague and as non-committal as possible to attract the widest net of rubes you can. And I still largely think this, though I do think some of them have the right idea in mind in terms of trying to uh, run locally here. So I know it was, he goes through, but, you know, one of my biggest criticisms or, or one of the biggest reasons I'm skeptical is because of money. We know money wins, wins races, even if you don't want to accept certain kinds of money. Super PACs will dominate, especially if you are openly saying, hey, we have no actual platform. You make the platform. Like it's one thing for, you know, Bernie to run for president and you're not going to have, you know, any billionaires trying to back him because he's openly trying to make sure they don't really exist. It's another to say, hey, we're an completely open, clean slate. You decide what this party's about. Well, then you're going to have a lot of money coming in to decide what the party's about. And as I showed you earlier with Andrew Yang, he, <laughs> you know, was a part of this process. So I'm not really sure how they decide or will decide to uh, combat that issue of money in the political process without actually having the power to change it. And last piece here, um, this is from the Southern Poverty Law Center, Andrew Yang to speak alongside far-right figures at Freedom Fest. Now, I will say, uh, on its face, this is terrible, but I understand his from his perspective, he's trying to reach a wide net of people here. The criticism here is that, you know, there are people that are there that are adjacent to extremists, and they even give an example, like uh, Nick Fuentes, who was a white nationalist, he was kicked out. So, you know, once, which <laughs> you have to wonder, though, why was he even set to host anything? They really didn't know who he was until taking a deeper look. No, it's likely because there was a spotlight put on the fact that he was going to be there. They didn't want that negative attention, and then they kicked him out. So anyways... My point here, though, is that I want to, you know, is Yang going to show up to, I don't know, a DSA conference? Like, is he going to show up to some left-wing conference and try to speak to people there? Or is he going to continue just showing up at these freedom, these freedom events that almost always inevitably are inviting into, you know, white nationalist uh, fasc fascistic circles? That's a, uh, I think, a fair question. And Yang tends to have a history of being a little too open to accepting people on the far right as opposed to engaging with people on the far left. But there you go. That's the forward party. As I said, they have some good ideas that I think the Democratic Party, if they are to be successful, should maybe think about like trying to run a little more investing into local races, especially in more red states, invest on a more local and state level, build those parties up. But uh, it's essentially a series of independents connected by a few shared values that aren't even really shared values if you are not really serious about them. Like, as I said, freedom. You can't be serious about individual freedom and be accepting of people that are for forced birth. So not too sure about this forward party. But there's your little breakdown. A lot of super chats here. Let me grab these. So Ben Shapiward says, Hi, David. Any remarks about the GPC leadership race and Alex Tyrell's expulsion from said party? Seems Queen Elizabeth May prefers coronations. Uh, so I read a little bit about this. Alex, why am I forgetting details now? 
there was a re- oh he was kicked out because he was uh they thought he was a little too sympathetic to russia i think that was that was the criticism of him i don't know enough about alex to to give my perspective on on his positions and who he is um but it does seem like elizabeth may she's apparently running again to lead the green party after leaving it just a few years ago like a couple years ago i don't know i don't know what's going on with the green party uh it's it's like why did you even leave then if you're just going to come back and lead the party again it might as well be the elizabeth may party i don't know Ryan Nowicki says, with the composition of the court and those like Thomas, do you see SCOTUS doing a Bush v. Gore style election theft as more of a win, uh, not if situation? Yeah. Um, if given the opportunity, absolutely. I mean, they, as you pointed out, they essentially already stole an election. So if given the opportunity, yes, they they will they will do that. I mean, if the election between Biden and Trump was closer, you may have seen um, something like that in front of the Supreme Court and them decide the election again. So, you know, I wouldn't. This is why these elect. This is why you really need the popular vote to decide this stuff, because once you have this really convoluted setup, it invites scenarios like this. Bruce Leroy, thank you for uh, your very interest. I haven't seen this before. Behind the scenes. Thank you for your behind the scenes little uh, emoji here and uh, donation. Thank you. Dave L says Yang's an affable guy and correctly understands the dysfunction in Congress, but ultimately he's doing libertarian and magical thinking. He, I will say, I, I've he was doing that before, but now he's not even, like this forward party from what I've seen, UBI is not even a part of it. So that was Yang. Like, that's why Yang was even a thing at all. Was it? He was for universal basic income. And that the Ford party, that was supposed to be a part of that. That's just poof. <laughs> it's evaporated. Because now they have no real positions, except for vagueness around freedom. And to be fair, a little more specifics around the actual electoral process, which I agree with. But I, I don't even know what yang's in terms of what yang's goals were before i'm not sure how much of that is actually in this new iteration of the party that guy you know says why do you think so many movie slash media critique channels are right leaning interesting i try to watch a seemingly sensible review and it feels like nine times out of ten they have terrible views um that's a good question because i don't really watch any of that stuff like i don't i don't watch movie critiques or reviews um so i and i'm not sure what media critique would be like i do media critique but is that what you're talking about but i don't know to be honest i I would assume that they're not like a lot of people that are into art or are able to assess art in that way are not typically um you know conservative minded Unless it's like all, you know, I don't know, um, like Marvel movie stuff, but I don't know. I don't know enough about that area to properly assess. Robert Erickson says, greetings from Sweden. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> all right. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? That was That was a good time. Let me grab some random chats and then I'll probably get out of here. Hizzle says, I don't know why, but Yang reminds me of Zuckerberg. It's probably because of the the techno dude bro kind of like approach to things. We do need a new party that is not corrupt, says Austin. I, uh, if there was a way for that to be successful, ultimately, look. The investment into local races is in like school districts, that kind of thing. That's the right approach to have. If you want to build an actual party that can sustain and, and, and have power and forward party appears to be at least trying that aspect of it. So, you know, I, I want to see how that, if they're serious about that, I want to see how that works out, especially in states that are not, you know, red states. Um, Cause if they can build an actual 
some kind of unified approach here to that part of a building a party, then it may give, at the very least, sort of a uh, a blueprint for others. Celeste says, get a job. Now it says, message redacted. Celeste, why are you always trolling? Like, Celeste is like, not like a, she's not a troll. I mean, she is. But, or he, I'm not sure if you're a girl or a guy. I actually don't know who you are. Um, but Celeste is usually, uh, you know, a, a, an avid viewer, but very mean. Celeste is very mean. I don't know why. What a mean person. Underdog Rising says, I supported Yang's UBI because it didn't use means testing. Means testing welfare is a nightmare. You can be a single parent and get 50 bucks a month for food stamps. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the one benefit to a approach like that. Um, that said, Yang's approach from at least some interviews he did was that the UBI would replace the social safety net or the welfare state, which is completely insane. Because at that point, then, you know, then you're not really solving any problems. So it, it's really about how it's implemented. And it, as long as it's not, as long as UBI, universal basic income is not looked at as a panacea, then it can be, you know, supplemental. But if it's seen as the end all be all, it's not going to, it's not going to be that. Donald James says, Andrea Cyberdemon says she knows you, David. Yes, I know Andrea. Andrea's great. I should act, I should have Andrea on the show. I, uh, I enjoy her content quite a bit. Actually, that's a question for all you. Do you guys want to see more interviews or no? I feel like I've stopped. I haven't done an interview in like two months. And uh, it's for a variety of reasons. It's mostly, I just, I'm very antisocial. <laughs> that's, that's the main reason. Um, but I wouldn't mind talking, you know, having people on. It's more about, I don't know. Like sometimes it's easier to get across that person's article or perspective or whatever it is they're presenting through just covering it myself in my own way as opposed to doing an interview because you know interviews are I feel like serve a very specific audience and aren't always the most effective at actually uh, delivering the message that I want to deliver Maybe do collabs instead. What the hell's the difference? I'm like, <laughs> I'm not saying like, so that, that's from zero is, but like, I, I'm honestly asking, what is a, how is a collab different than an interview? Are we collaborating on a discussion? Isn't that what that would be? Or do you mean like bring someone as, on as like a co-host? You should interview Fetterman and question him on his support of Israel. Here's the thing. I'm not going to change the man's mind. He uh, has clearly taken that perspective, the wrong perspective, for a strategic purpose. Because he was very, really said nothing about the issue up until recently, up until his interview with, uh, I think it was Jewish Insider. I forget who it was. But it was... Uh, he basically wants to avoid the wrath of APAC. That's obvious. And it's unfortunate. But he's making a strategic choice that if he's going to win this election, then he has to, at the very least, in uh, while running, um, be intentionally ignorant. But like, Oz's position is, I'm sure, worse. So there's really no... 
And that's what elections are. You know, primaries are where you get to choose, you know, the best person you can. And then a general is ultimately your vote is a tool. There is no perfect candidate. Mary says, hi, David. Bye, David. Hi, Mary. Bye, Mary. Thank you for showing up. Looks like Ford Party dropped UBI. Kind of feels like Yang sold out. It is really interesting to see, like, he, he used that as his way to gain popularity and then just dropped it in this merger with these other two groups. But I, you know, I'm sure his reasoning is that because it's not about the policy, it's about their approach. And then the policy changes depending on the state, but they do have like three other shared values in terms of what I mentioned earlier. So there is at least, you know, some positions that they do agree on or do have to agree on to be a part of the party. Not your daddy has a bunch of fingers pointing down to my head saying tool. Very... Very brilliant. <laughs> That's some good thinking there. <clears throat> All right, let me scroll up. Let's see if I get some other stuff. Tim Fry says, do a rap session. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Can you imagine? Austin says, randomly, Kyle Kalinske. I assume that was an answer to some question that I had. Or some other comment. I don't know. YouTube just told me that now would be a good time to insert an ad, but I'm not going to do it. Instead, I will tell you to go to the rationalnational.com slash join. That's the Patreon page. Links are below the video. Support the show or hit join on YouTube. And at the bare minimum, come on, hit subscribe, hit the bell icon to receive all notifications. That's the bare minimum. But if you want to help out, Super Chats, uh, join on YouTube or join on Patreon or send a tip through PayPal, all are uh, welcomed. Winston says, did you see that reps are panicking about Oz and might focus on Colorado and Washington Senate races? <laughs> really? I did not see that, but that's hilarious. Black Hawk says he probably meant you should interview Kyle. Oh, I see. Well, if I do interviews again, I don't know, maybe. Interview Rokana or Jayapal. I have very, I'll be honest, I have very little interest in talking to politicians because they're very calculated in how they answer questions. They're usually very boring interviews. Um, like the only person that I would really want to talk to at some point, uh, if my anxiety can handle it, is Bernie Sanders. And it wouldn't be about like, the conversation wouldn't be about modern day politics. It wouldn't be about like, oh, how are you going to get past, uh, or how are you passing, you know, build back better or some, some, some stupid shit like that. It would, it would be a, about his career. Like, I'd want to ask him about like, you know, more about his life because I, I'm actually interested in that. And there hasn't really been, as far as I've seen, no one's done an interview like that with him, which is weird. You know, start booking those interviews now, people, because... Uh, you know, Bernie's not going to be here forever. Like there, there should be a, a, a sit down, like hour long interview 
about his career. And I know he doesn't, I, I guess the biggest issue is Bernie hates talking about himself. And I totally get that because I also hate <laughs> talking about myself. But there's a lot there to learn and uh, just to understand, like, how, 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 how are you so consistent? Like, how is it that I was, when I was like six years old, you were in Congress, like yelling about how people need, needed help and how the government was abandoning them. Like, how are you saying that while no, while nobody was watching, that while nobody cared, and you kept that message going as long as you did? And why did you wait so long to run for president is also a question I would have for him. Like, why didn't you run sooner? Get your name out sooner. Get these issues in front of people sooner. Um, and I, I have to think, honestly, that if he, if he has any regrets, that's maybe one of his regrets, that he didn't try and run for president sooner. At the very least, like, not that he would have won, you know, back in like 2008 or earlier, but just that it, it would accomplish largely what his first run accomplished, and that was nationalizing a lot of these issues. And if you do that, if he had done that sooner, um, who knows? We could have been further along in these discussions. But, uh, like, there's so much about Bernie that I would like to learn that people just haven't asked him about. And and really, like, an interview like that, you don't, you don't almost have to wait till he's retired. Because then he'd be, I think, a little more open about discussing what it's like and discussing and being free to criticize certain people and, and how things operate that he wouldn't necessarily be as open to doing right now. But there's definitely a good Bernie Sanders interview that is possible that nobody has done yet. Donald James says, or do this to support David. Thank you for your super chat, Donald. Yes, super chats, also good. No, we are not talking about the forward party. I mean, I guess I could change it to this. Whoa, look at that. Black Hawk says, you're busy, but you should consider a gaming stream sometime. Fall Guys is free on all consoles right now. And I think everybody here would absolutely adore that stream. Uh, maybe. I do worry, though, it can alienate some people. I, I don't think, I don't know. My channel has a, a wide spectrum of viewers. Um, so if I start randomly doing gaming stuff... I feel like it would alienate a lot of people. But that's why I got the Twitch channel. So I would likely do it there. But I would have to be consistent for it to be any, to be for it to be uh, worth it. Now we get some stupid stupid bullshit. There we go. Freaking Spam messages. All right. I just realized I got some time. There's some other stories I didn't I just didn't get to cover last week. So, I got some time. I got like, you know, 20 minutes. 10 20 minutes. Um why don't I just bring some of this shit up? I do feel like today's been kind of a slow day. I don't know, maybe it's just me. But there hasn't been a whole lot that has you know, got my eye today, but, um, I saw this, 
Might as well watch this quickly. Democrats keep control of the House. And Apologies if that spiked the audio. Actually, no, it's close to my voice. Do you hope Democrats keep control of the House and Senate? I think people are sick and tired of politics, Chuck. I really do. I think they're sick and tired of Democrats and Republicans fighting and feuding and holding pieces of legislation hostage because they didn't get what they wanted or something or someone might mm -hmm. get credit for something. Why don't we start doing something for our country? Why don't we just say, this is good for right. America? I've always said the best politics is good government. Do something good, Chuck. But I, I'm not going to predict what's going to happen. I'm not asking you to I predict. I just want to make sure we do something good. And this is What result do you <laughs> want? Do you want the Democrats to keep control of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives? Oh, I love, uh, you know, I'm not making those choices or de decisions on that. I'm going to work with whatever I have. I've always said that. I think the Democrats have great candidates that are running. They're good people I've worked with. And I have a tremendous amount of respect and friendship with my Republican colleagues. So I can work on either side very easily. So you don't care so don't the have outcome. A problem you don't care about the, the outcome this year of the election. Well, whatever, whatever the voters, whatever the voters choose, I can't decide what's <laughs> going to happen in Kansas or California yeah. or Texas. I really can't. I've always taken taken the approach: whoever you send me, that's your representative, and I respect them, and I respect the state for the people they send, and I give it my best to work with them to do the best for my country. I don't play the politics that way. I don't like it that way. I'm just. You're literally a Democratic senator. What do you mean playing politics? That's not who I am. I'm going to give Chuck Todd incredibly rare credit. I mean, he, he forget it. He doesn't deserve it because anyone should ask this question. But like, he actually a asked a question that no one really asks Manchin. Will you support other Democrats? As a Democratic senator, three times he asked him. And Manchin would not answer the question. You have members of the Democratic Party that will say, oh, Bernie, not a real Democrat. Not a, he's an independent, not a real Democrat. Even though he fights for what the vast majority of people in the country support based on public polling, even though he backs Democratic candidates, votes with Democrats, except when he doesn't be on, you know, actual principle and, and uh for example, the chips bill, I covered that recently. But then you have someone like Manchin, who is a Democrat in name, yet blocks Biden's entire agenda, sinks his, his entire agenda, the Build Back Better bill, won't even say he supports the Democratic Party in the midterms, won't even say he wants them to win as a Democratic senator. Now, understand why he's doing this. His numbers in West Virginia are going up because of Republican voters. And recently, because it came out that he worked with Schumer on this new deal to combat inflation that has like a tiny bit of money in terms of climate change. And um, which, of course, they say, oh, the biggest investment of all time. No one's ever made a climate change investment like this. Yeah, because you haven't done shit on this issue. So, of course, any investment appears to be huge. But, you know, this bill, this combat inflation bill, and it, it actually has like a, a, uh, a uh, like 15% tax, uh, corporate tax that's enforced. So he has that. Because of that, he gets all this bad press from Republicans that are criticizing him now about how Manchin screwed us and all this. So now Manchin has to come out in this show to say, oh, I, I'm not... I'm not political. As a Democratic senator, I cannot endorse Democrats in the midterms. So he's trying to play all sides here. He's trying to, you know, I guess, apparently combat a lot of the op-eds that have come out about him, about his connections to money and why he's actually, why he's actually been doing what he's been doing in terms of fighting any, uh, anything at all in terms of uh, climate, while also maintaining his Republican support base by refusing to actually endorse any Democrats. It really is this amazing balancing act that, I mean, is not going to really change anything. Like, maybe you'll see some Democratic lawmakers come out now and be like, what the hell's Manchin doing? But I think a lot of them are afraid to push Manchin to the other party, which really wouldn't be much of a difference, except, we have to be honest, on one issue, just one issue, and that's in terms of confirming judges. But 
apart from that, Manchin basically is a Republican. So I don't know. And they they could actually potentially gain a lot more, especially Biden could gain a lot by being openly critical and vilify. If, he, if Biden came out strong and like vilified Manchin, you would see Biden's poll numbers go up. I guarantee it because Biden's losing with younger voters. He's losing with Democratic voters. That's why his numbers are down. Not, not because of conservatives. Biden's numbers are down because he's losing Democrats. So if he comes out and, and you know, destroys Manchin, talks about Manchin's connections to the coal industry and all this, like, like, can you imagine a world like that? Where the President Biden actually came out and did that, even if they didn't pass anything, he, by, at least it, it would show fight, right? Like it would show people at home, hey, this guy's Biden's trying to fight for us. He's actually calling out what the problem is. And it's he points out that Manchin's clearly a, a obstacle here. So he's right to point out that, you know, they need two senators. They will get this done because he's saying that Manchin's the issue. But Biden not saying that makes you think, is Manchin really the issue? If Manchin wasn't there, would it be Chris Coons in that place? So, yeah. Manchin isn't the only problem here. It's the fact that Biden isn't fighting, and then you have to ask, why isn't Biden properly fighting? And it can't simply be about decorum. There has to be more to it. But if it is just about about decorum, then Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, maybe put your priorities uh, in check. All right, so that was the Manchin video. What else did I save here? What did I save? Where is all my shit? Oh, here we go. Oh, there is a new thing out today. So I I can't do two Fetterman videos in a row because I just I won't allow myself. It's it's like trying to eat two chocolate bars back to back. Can't do it. I would like to do it, but I can't do it. But that said, I did see a uh, new Fetterman video put out today that I would like to share. This one is great. Just great. Check this out. Let me check the audio on this. Sometimes these things pop. Once you get about $40,000 of income, the value of money dramatically decreases in your life. And it's very hard to discern significant differences in happiness in someone who's making $50,000 or $50 million. So the guy I use is a Turkish tailor. Nice. Uh -huh. He uses Zenya fabrics, but he makes all the, Turks, the, the suits in Turkey. I'm excited to be featured on the cover of the newest issue of Success Magazine. His new home studio, that looks beautiful. Right outside that wall behind me is a basketball court and a gym. So for those folks who want to know how to travel, let me share some insights because I've done a ton of it recently. It's very hard to discern significant differences in happiness in someone who's making $50,000 or $50 million. God Once you get damn, this campaign is so good. Like this is one of these rare cases where if I was running this campaign, I don't think I would be this good. <laughs> I wouldn't be this smart. Like this is, this is a perfect campaign, perfectly run campaign. He's hitting him from every angle. Fetterman is, is setting the narrative. He's not reacting to what's being said about him. He's he's the one setting the discussion about Oz being from out of state. He's from New Jersey. About Oz being disconnected. He's a you know Doc Hollywood. He doesn't know the difference between fifty thousand and fifty a billion. Meanwhile, he's talking about his basketball court. Talking about it. He's on his yacht, like his mansion. The whole thing. Kissing his Hollywood star. Jesus. I, I can't say enough good things about this campaign. So well done. The, and look, it's it's almost unfair because Oz is such a the perfect candidate to go up against if you're someone who's going to be an actual working class populist like Fetterman uh, is. If you're going to if you're that candidate, Oz is the perfect target. Here's a guy who just parachuted in from a different state. He's a Hollywood doctor. He's has all these stupid quotes he he was backed by trump yet you know years ago he has his his positions on every issue has morphed depending on who the audience is he sold pills that did nothing 
like this there is so much rich content here to work with and fetterman has been using it all it's whoever's running his campaign like make sure you go to other campaigns don't just stick with fetterman like once fetterman hopefully fetterman wins this seat jump around the party like do like whoever needs your help next that is an actually good candidate like fetterman is um go there and help them because they need this sort of uh perspective so let's just see i'm just curious what else did fetterman post today maybe there's some some new cool stuff some new vids profits 17.85 billion in profits oh yeah so this came out over the weekend the amount of money that these oil giants have made in the face of high gas prices <laughs> zenga fabric Oh my god. This is uh activating my my cough on the deepest levels. Our campaign's internal polls show that Dr. Oz owns the demographics of dudes that own nine or more gigantic mansions, prefers a candidate that lives in New Jersey. People who actually know what the fuck Zegna Fabrics is. Oh my freaking god. Oh my God. This campaign has it all. It's got comedy. It's got, uh, it's got policy. Fetterman minus Israel. Good candidate. Um, man, what a freaking campaign. Okay. I think, uh, that's probably all. Oh, they did this too. Humber will, a, a humble request for fundraising. Okay, that's boring. All right, man. Good, good, good stuff. What else did I save here? Okay, so I haven't seen this, but this was last week. Maybe some of you saw this. I'm just curious. I'm just curious what's going on here. Newsmax's Eric Bowling. Let's watch. Remember the Democrat Rhode Island state senator twerking upside down and posting it to TikTok? This is apparently the Democrats' best, but really, what all of this highlights is a generation of attention-hungry children who never grew up. And under Joe Biden, the woke mob left is in charge, and they're making America a laughing stock. Do they have to blur it out? Is that... <laughs> it's like they're doing that to make it seem, like, more offensive than it actually is. And these are the people that are complaining about how, oh, people are so offended nowadays. Meanwhile, they're... Blurring out a perfectly fine twerk. I don't know. I don't know what you people are doing here. Look at this. A parent forcing her child, who appears not to want any part of it, forcing him to watch radical LGBT activists. That's right, you guessed it. Yes, because children are always so well behaved. Go to any Santa Claus parade, you will see a reaction from a child like that. And then, do you see, uh, I don't know, some left-wing channel if they exist? Come out and say, oh my God, look, look at this. This is why we have to cancel Christmas because this child does not want to look at Santa Claus. This is why it's got to be happy holidays. Can you imagine? That would be the equivalent of this. <laughs> it's like the left actually trying to cancel Christmas by uh, showing children misbehaving in the crowd. Amazing. Twerk during pride celebrations. What's with the twerk thing? Not only is this the moral decay in America, but... There's clearly a twerking epidemic, and the left-wing mob is doing everything, everything they can to keep the twerking going and corrupt our nation's youth. What? That's how they can radically transform America, folks. That's what they want to do, deprive children of their innocence, destroy the family unit, and, of course, destroy faith. 
That's the left-wing plan. Right now in America, belief in God has fallen to the lowest level since the Gallup survey started back in 1944. And it's fallen almost among adults and young adults. And I'm sorry. 81% still? Isn't that kind of high? Belief in God in the U.S. dips to 81%. I thought it was lower than that, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's at 81% and they're complaining? Oh my goodness. And you guessed it, Democrats. They've abandoned faith, replacing it with the Church of Liberalism, worshiping party, and the state. So what follows all this? A nation with no moral compass. <sighs> that was ridiculous. <laughs> don't even... I don't even know what to say. Um, how how do you do a whole segment about twerking? And that is somehow like an example of how the woke left mob is corrupting the minds because butts exist. That That's corrupting the minds of people. Okay. Depends what version of God. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, look, I don't, I don't believe in God, but I do think there's clearly more to, uh, you know, our universe than we know. I do believe in higher power, but I don't think it's like an individual with like a beard and a and a cane that was like the literal father of jesus so yeah i guess it but like i wouldn't but if i was asked that question i would say no because the way that god is typically discussed is is like god is a person that is a spirit or like our creator who's like a conscious creator as opposed to just they're i don't know being things that we don't know i'm open to the idea that there are things that we don't know but i don't think they're invisible people in the sky Oh, I want to cover this too. A lot we happened last week. Oh, I got five minutes. All right. Five more minutes. Let's uh, speed through this one. These people are hilarious. Actually, I'm, I'm going to put this on like 1.5 speed. We should still be able to understand what's going on. He didn't lose. Since you. He just didn't lose. Do you believe the election was stolen? Yes. Do you have faith in elections now? No. Do you believe the 2020 election was, was stolen? Uh, no, I don't believe the 2020 election was stolen. I believe that there are aspects of the 2020 election that were unfair. In Arizona, a Republican party at odds with itself. Trump and Pence holding competing events with two very different understandings of reality. We need a landslide so big that the radical left cannot rig it or steal it, even if they try. At Trump's rally, a bonfire of conspiracy theories. Have you watched the January 6th hearings? I have. What do you think? I think they're a bunch of bullshit. Why? Well, because do you have both sides or are you getting one side of the story? You mean like the side that attacked the Capitol? You really believe that happened? I was there. Okay. I have a lot of people that were there too. And? And saw things that it wasn't what they say it was. But there's been hundreds of Trump supporters now charged. I don't know if they're guilty. So, so, and do you think it's right for those people to have those people in jail and not get any justice in our American system? Are you kidding me? Do you think it was right that they attacked the Capitol? I don't, they didn't. That was an inside job, buddy. Vast conspiracy theory that those who stormed the Capitol were not Trump supporters is widespread here. Have you guys been watching the January 6th hearings at all? No. No? No, we saw it when it all went down, and then we saw like a lot of the BLM and the Antifa people in the building as well, and, and, and it's just it's just nonsense. But all. I think like 800 people now have been charged, right? Yeah. None of them are Black Lives Matter or Antifa. Yeah, that They're doesn't not mean anything. That doesn't Correct. mean They anything have not been country. brought into court and for their due process because they have not been arrested. Uh, Hunter Biden hasn't been arrested. Trump has told lies about the election in that he said he didn't really lose. Do you think that all the lies about the election are damaging for American democracy? You believe he lied? Do you not? No, I do not. I don't. I mean, he won. But these are no longer fringe ideas. A majority of Republicans do not believe Biden legitimately won the election. Hey, guys, any of you want to talk to us? We just got to stop. Like, 
that's that's the most important piece here because you, you could always pull out like individual crazy people, but to see that that seventy percent of Republicans think that Biden did not legitimately win. I mean, we know this party is insane, but this helps to really put it into perspective. Like, Jesus, Lord. So, how many millions of people is that? Because, like, it's, you know, obviously not everybody in the country votes. But it's still, we're talking about a substantial portion of 300 million people think this. I don't know. I'm not sure what you do about that. Like, that's... This is what the, the issue I always come to, because I think about the way my brain works. Is how do I solve? How do I help even in a, a little tiny way? How do I help solve this problem? But you can't. You can't get the how I can't get through to these people. They're not watching me. And if even if they did, they're not going to see or they don't care what I'm giving them. They're not going to believe what I'm saying. Like they only believe what reinforces their own narrative. So they just live in a completely different world, walled off from reality, whatever makes them feel good, protects their feelings because they can't accept the fact that their, their dear leader lost an election. I don't know how to get through to people like that. Um, they're just completely gone. It's very sad, actually. Is any of you want to talk to us? The Proud Boys, who Trump once infamously told to stand back and stand by, now a regular fixture outside his events. Any Proud Boys want to talk to us today? No? You watching January 6th hearings? No, nothing to say. I'm projecting. I'm projecting because I know that Biden won the election. <laughs> okay. Whatever you say, buddy. There's no CNN, right? CNN, yeah. Not fun? Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. The former president here to campaign for a ticket of conspiracy theory spouting candidates who say they would have overturned the results of the 2020 election in Arizona, like Carrie Lake, candidate for governor. And I know for a fact we will no longer accept rigged elections. Who's with me on that? Pence here campaigning for Lake's Republican rival. Arizona needs Karen Taylor Robeson in the State House. Here we met some Republicans who are done with Trump. I voted for Trump twice. If uh, Mike Pence runs, I'm voting for Mike Pence. Okay, so why is that? I just think that, you know, everyone's seen the January 6th committee. Uh, he stood up for democracy that day. You know, he's like, I'm not leaving the Capitol because um, I need to be here. And he was the one that was making phone calls to the military and trying to fix the situation while Trump was crying. I don't, I don't, I also don't get these people. <laughs> like, how, how do you, how do you support Mike Pence? What? Jesus Christ. In the dining room. But even among this crowd, there is sympathy for Trump's election lies and support for a 2024 run. You're about to see Pence speak here. Uh, Trump's not a big fan of him right now. I understand that. I hear that he could have not certified those results pending all the claims of the fraud. And I wish he would have done that. Pence had no legal basis to do that. Also among those here, Rusty Bowers, a lifelong Republican and Speaker of the Arizona State House. We're talking to a lot of people in here today who said they're not even, they're not watching the January 6th hearings. They still believe the yeah, lies about the 2020 election. How do you, what, what would be your message to them? I have no message for him. I can't help him. If you don't want to look, you don't want to see, then you won't see. You know, but I've seen enough to know, and I know that other people right in this room have done their best to count everything and do it all right. He tested. Whoa, whoa! We don't have to. We don't have to get rid of that guy who made that comment. I may have interpreted it wrong, um, but no, it's like no. You can you can show those messages. Just because I disagree with someone doesn't mean this is a message to mods. Doesn't mean you have to, uh, you know, delete their message or ban them. There, they are reinstated. But I, I may have even read the, read the message wrong. He may be talking about somebody else, or like the people that we were looking at, as opposed to me. Suffice before the January sixth. Anyways, I do actually have to go. So. Um, this has been fun, minus this part. These people are crazy. But if any of you know how to solve this problem of these uh, people that are living in a different world, um, please get, get working. Get to it. Because uh, I think the world needs your help. No one knows how to solve that problem. All right. Thank you all for showing up. And uh, goodbye. See you all tomorrow. Bye-bye. How do I leave this thing?
Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Here we go. Bye-bye.